Sweet Melissa, 17, good morning. Good Sunday morning. Cheryl Prince, 52, good morning. Carolyn Lack, Michelle uh, Daniel, 90. Sweet Melissa, uh, Clint Parker, Natalia Castile. Good morning to all of you on this Sunday, this beautiful, magical, magnificent Sunday that we're all so blessed to wake up in. Today is World Baking Day. Um, today is Sunday Paper Live. Welcome to the Sunday Paper Live. What is the Sunday Paper? This is the Sunday Paper. I actually print it out because I'm a sucker for things in my hands. Um, most of the time I read it on my phone, but the Sunday Paper is a free digital newspaper that comes to you every Sunday. Its mission is to inspire hearts and minds and move humanity forward one person at a time. Its mission is to highlight the voices of architects of change. Those are people who see challenges, imagine something different and go out and do it. They're people who have inspiring voices, optimistic, motivating. So the whole paper is designed to bring you news that is informing and inspiring. It's all designed to make you feel good. It's all designed to make you smart, uh, inspire you, the whole thing. So, uh, and we started doing Sunday Paper Live during the stay at home period. And many of you had asked me for it before and I just kind of didn't have time to do it. I was traveling so much, but I actually had time to do it now. And the response has been wonderful. So we're, we're gonna continue at it. Um, so I wanna thank you all for um, getting up with me on a Sunday. I think for the East Coasters, you're kind of, you're in the brunch time, right? You're in the brunch time period. And today I'm really excited because we have Christina Tosi who started the Milk Bar. She's an award-winning pastry chef. We have her on World Baking Day. And she actually, my daughter's, the Milk Bar is my daughter Christina's favorite place on earth. So um, I'm super excited about her, super excited that we're gonna be talking with uh, Marlo Thomas and Phil Donahue. This piece of hair is driving me crazy. Uh, a little bit later on about what makes marriage last, about love, and they've been married. This Thursday, it'll be 40 years. 40 years. 40 years. So I think there's a lot we can learn from them. There's a lot we can learn from Christina. Um, every uh, Sunday, I start out the Sunday paper writing about what I've been thinking. And um, this Sunday I wrote about a question that somebody asked me when I was out walking. And the question was, is what are your three wishes for the world right now? For the country, for the world, for your community? And the question, the man who asked me said, you know, they don't even have to be possible. You don't, it's not like you have to achieve them by the end of the week, but what are your three wishes? So I pose that question back to you to think about what your three wishes are for our world right now, for our country, uh, for you, for your family. What are your three wishes? And they can be wishes that you can turn into reality. Um, they can be wishes for our larger world, but it's an interesting thing to talk about at your kitchen table. It's an interesting thing for you to think about. Um, it might just, start a whole new conversation with yourself or it might start an interesting conversation with somebody that you love. So that's what I'm writing about. Um, and I always start with a quote. And today, the quote in the Sunday paper is from Louisa May Alcott and it says, we all have the power to make wishes come true as long as we keep believing. We all have the power to make wishes come true as long as we keep believing. Think about that. We all have the power to make wishes come true. Our wishes, they can be wishes for our family, they can be wishes that we have for ourselves, they can be wishes that we have for our larger world. And I've learned in my lifetime that when those wishes are kind of bigger than ourselves, when they kind of help other people, they make us feel really validated, hopeful, 
grounded and good. And so think about your wishes today. Think about that quote, we all have the power to make wishes come true as long as we keep believing. And this is a good time to get back in touch with your believing, to get back in touch with your hope, to get back in touch with your optimism. And I love um, also in the Sunday paper today, Mar Martha Beck writes about resilience and how to develop resilience. Uh, Marissa Peer talks about how to accomplish your goals in lockdown. That is really good. Carolyn Meiss, uh, wow, how to find an opportunity in a crisis. She is such a beautiful writer. All of these people actually are such great writers and they're so inspiring and they're so uplifting and they're so practical. Um, so all of them are really extraordinary. Marissa Peer is gonna be on Home Together with Patrick and I tomorrow, um, and I, I love her. And I'm gonna to start today though with World Baking Day and uh, with Christina Tosi. And her one of her wishes, one of her dreams, was to uh, create the milk bar. And she did it, and I've been in it. And uh, so she's also an award-winning pastry chef but she's also a small business owner. And I thought it would be really great to talk to somebody who on this day is renowned for their craft, but is also a small business owner. So understands um, about employing people, about the decisions about to open, to not open, and also someone who's been bringing joy through her Instagram videos. Um, every day I've been watching her, I watched her with her mom. And uh, since I'm not a good cook, but I do love to bake, I thought this would also be really great for me. So now I'm going to I'm going to let her hopefully she's I hope she's requested. There she is. Oh my goodness. My daughter wanted to come and be a part of this. So it's so exciting. Hi. Hi Maria, how are you? I'm wonderful. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thank you. Also, you're so sweet. Thank you for the kind words. It's, um, it's so true. I've been watching you with your dog, uh, doing your baking <laughs> videos. I watched you with your mom uh, doing on Mother's Day. You did the Sunday, and it was so inspiring. And as I said, my daughter Christina introduced me to the milk bar. And I, every time I'd come to New York, I'd go in and buy some things and bring them back. And then she's like, Mom, you do know that you can get them now in L.A. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> but she was so I'm so happy that you're here. You have a recipe in the Sunday paper today about cookies, which yes. you're gonna help with. So before we get to that, Christina, on World Baking Day, I know you're you're also a small business owner, you're an employer. What's it like for you now? What's it been like and what's it like for you on this day? Man, um it is it's a fight and it's a fight that I'm here for. I mean, I don't think that you start a small business without a great deal of grit, yeah. um, without a great deal of passion, and without the like the the acknowledgement that no one does it alone. That it might yeah. be your dream, but that dream is not a reality without the people that believe in you and show up and are really the heroes of making your business happen every day. And so, um, I mean. I, I think every single day about like, I'm stuck in this, like, how do you say thank you? And how do you say great job? And those are like the things that are the stickiest to me right now. But Maria, it's sort of like one day at a time, one yeah. step at a time. You got to wake up. You got to stay positive. You got to be flexible. Yeah. And it's not that different. I mean, the circumstances are very different right now, but it's not a different mentality than what it's taken me over the past 11 years to build Milk Bar into what it is. Um, if anything, I think it just is a reminder that when I show up, I have to show up with the utmost like care and humanity and heart and to, and to vocalize these things every single moment because doing it from afar, you know, so much doesn't translate um, when you're on a call or, yeah. or what have you, but it's, it's definitely the challenge of my lifetime. Well, you say it's the challenge of your lifetime. I love what you said that nobody starts a small business. Nobody makes a wish into a reality or a dream without grit, without discipline, without optimism. But you say it's the challenge of a lifetime. Is it the challenge to keep them going? Is it a challenge to employ all the people that have helped you? What's the challenge of a lifetime? 
The challenge of a lifetime is about finding a balance between all of these different topics, right? Like yeah. what comes first? Well, our team comes first because Milk Bar is nothing without the people behind it. But finding the balance of putting them first doesn't necessarily mean keeping every single one of them employed right this second. One, because some of them are not comfortable coming to work um, for the for the few stores that are open for pickup and delivery. Some of them are not comfortable coming to work in our kitchens because they have families whose health and well-being they're thinking about, or they have different, res their responsibilities have shifted either because their kids can't go to school. So it's about understanding what showing up for the team first means. And sometimes it's personal to them. And then sometimes from a business standpoint, it is what is the safest, best way to keep this business going? Because if all I'm doing is employing my team with a paycheck, but there is no work behind it, then I am not giving them a long-term safety and security. I am not giving them something that is a job that they can depend on and be passionate about for the long-term. And so a lot of it is balancing that sense of humanity with the short-term and long-term perspective. And while also celebrating them because they're showing up to make layer cakes and cookies and pies that uh, we're sending to healthcare professionals, to people that are shut in celebrating birthdays and graduations and anniversaries and people that are trying to stay really positive uh, from afar right now and, and, and balancing the care for the team and the care for how the team shows up in the world and their work shows up in the world. And it's kind of like, I sort of say, it's like trying to double dutch with five different jump ropes. You know, like it's a tangled mess and you're constantly yeah. like getting caught in it and you got to just say, okay, here we go. Let's untangle it and let's get back in and let's figure it out. But it's, it's short-term and long-term thinking. Yeah. And that's so, tricky. There's so many people are going smart thinking smart. So many, I've, I have a lot of uh, friends who have small businesses and they've done everything from furlough people to cut salaries, to go in and try to, you know, kind of keep it afloat themselves. What's your best advice to that small business owner out there who might have a restaurant, a retail shop, a bakery? So many people have started bakeries in the last 10 years following you, you know, and they're just sitting there going like, uh, I don't know what to do. I think you have to balance your passion for your business with the business realities. And you're going to find out what that is when you look at your P&L. You have to be nimble and flexible and try a few different things on for size. Because what we're seeing in our business is that every day there's a little bit of a change. Every day, you know, maybe someone wants to send a cake across the country more or less. Every day someone wants to order something for delivery now more or less or wants to come to a pickup window. And so you can't just make up your minds. And then say, that's what it is until shelter in place is lifted, until people start coming out again. You have to constantly be sort of trying things on for size and balancing your passion with the business realities. And you, I mean, it's, it is a 24 seven job right now. You have to be reaching out to the people in your industry. You have to be very well read about what's going on because like all good entrepreneurs, like no one's going to give you all the answers. And so you have to, you have to follow your instinct and your gut, but you have to follow that up with data. So, yeah, I love that. And, but you, what you've also done during this time, in addition to kind of, I'm sure, reaching out and trying to keep people employed and stuff is you started baking online here, right? To keep us all going with your dog and you're, you're like trying to do all of that too, right? Keeping us uh, entertained, giving us hope, uh, so tell me about like why you want to do that, how you do that on top of what you're doing. I think you froze there in your kitchen, but you're going to come back. I love that. You have to be part magician, part soothsayer, and part best chef. That is really smart. Actually wrote that, but Christina Tosi left. Okay, well, Christina Tosi has got to come back. Christina Tosi, wow, she was really smart about all of that, right? You have to balance all of these things. I love her analogy with the jump rope. Um, and uh, I, we, she's got to come back because she's got to make those cookies. Um, I love that. Oh, there's Allie Wildman. I know Allie Wildman. There's, where is Christina? I'm sure she's going to come back because she has, she does her cooking show from her kitchen. But I, I loved what she was saying there about, you know, you have to balance all of these things. You have to understand your employees. You have to be um, understanding of how, what they're thinking, whether they want to come back to work, whether they feel comfortable work, you have to 
kind of put on your business hat. You have to put on your creative hat. You're going to have to cook. You're going to have to balance the bottom line. There's a lot of stuff to, um, there's a lot of stuff to balance there, as she says. So she started the milk bar. I loved what she said. Nobody makes a dream or a wish come to fruition without the help of a lot of people. As they say, it always takes a village. Um, you have to have a lot of grit to be an entrepreneur. You have to, um, you have to have a lot of resilience. Martha Beck in the Sunday paper today talks about building resilience. If you didn't have it before or your resilience is shaky, read what Martha Beck has to say. And listen, I think to what Christina Tosi was saying there, you know, you have to understand you got to get up and you got to jump rope every day got to get up and you got to jump rope and that's easier said than done and for anybody who's jumped rope right you you trip up all the time you're always um a lot of the time you're not able you're not able to um you know jump rope and so she's got to balance all of these stores she's trying to say thank you i loved what she said there up oh, there she's back i know she was going to come back I knew she was going to come back. Where is she? Christina. Christina. Oh, where is she? Somewhere. She's going to come back. I know she's going to come back. She's, she's a small business owner. She's got grit. She's got resilience. She's not going to give up on us here at the Sunday paper. And she has cookies to make on World Baking Day. And she has inspiration to dole out. Um, <laughs> She has all of that because trust me, I cannot lead you forward on the cooking thing. I cannot help you on the cooking thing. So if Christina cannot come back, someone else is going to have to take us into their kitchen and they're going to have to cook the cookies. And she put the recipe, the sugar cookie recipe in uh, the Sunday paper today. She put the sugar cookie recipe in the Sunday paper. And so She's, I hope she's going to come back. We're going to be technically challenged today because I'm also going to have to do something very unusual for myself. I'm going to have to request Marlo and Phil to come on. I've never done that before. So you're also going to have to, you know, you don't have to do anything today. It's Sunday, but you're going to, I hope bear with me as I try to do that. But first I really want to find Christina because she was going to cook with us. And I really wanted to cook with her. I really wanted to learn about how to make the cookies because God, that just would be the bomb is to really figure out how to do the cookies. Maybe, maybe her dog, her dog is in all of her videos with her. Her dog's name is um, Butler. And um, maybe he like was crying or maybe he wanted to go out or maybe, um, Maybe he wanted to do something and she had to run and go do it. Or maybe her internet fell down. There's so many things that could happen. But since she's a small business owner, since she's an entrepreneur, since she's a woman with grit and perseverance, I know she will find her way back to the kitchen, my kitchen, your kitchen. And, but if she doesn't, you can find her beautiful cookies, um, Oh, tell us about something you cooked new. Oh, gosh. Ooh. I cook cookies and I cook and I make, I bake cakes. I tried doing egg bites, egg bites. It was not pretty. It um, just wasn't good. Um, somebody says, what paper? Um, it's called the Sunday paper. It's our digital newsletter. It comes out every Sunday. It's for free. Is Milk Bar. A small business. Yes, it is. It's called the Milk Bar, and she has all kinds of cake, cookies, cereal bar. I mean, it is, whoa, heaven. When will Marlo and Phil be on? They'll be on after we make the cookies. But if we don't make the cookies, they might be on a little bit earlier, or you're going to have to sit here and listen to me uh, talk. No, you don't have to listen to me talk. But I did say um, you can find Christina's in the Sunday paper today on World Baking Day. Beautiful sugar cookie recipe in the Sunday paper by one of the best bakers on the planet. 
She was also the subject of a great chef's table. She's also an entrepreneur. She's also doing cooking classes and cooking uh, displays all the time on her Instagram. Uh, so you can see that. And you can read about how to develop resilience like she was talking about if you read Martha Beck's piece in the Sunday paper today, um, which I love. And as I said, Marissa Peer is going to come on home together tomorrow with Patrick and I. We have really great people. So, oh, no, not tomorrow. She's coming on this week. Simon is coming on tomorrow. He has a to-be list on here. See, I printed it out. Simon Sinek, there you see. And he wants to be a student of life. He said, I want to be in service to the people I know and the people I don't. Oh, there's Christina. Christina Dosi. There we go. Wow. And I want to be a better listener. There you go. There you go. I hope she came. I hope she could find her way on here. And I appreciate her trying. She, I really appreciate her trying. Let's try it again. We're keep, she, it says she's unable to join us. When I press her request, it says she is unable to join us. I'm trying to add her, waiting for Christina. Oh, can I? Oh my gosh, it happened, Butter. Oh my. I'm so sorry. You, I mean, what are you gonna do? We're what in quarantine, it is what it is. That's you just right. gotta be persistent. That's it. Well, luckily you're persistent and I know how to vamp on live TV. So there we go. I love so. it. I was watching you the whole time, like trying to get to you. <laughs> okay, oh let's get God. to your Butter, come here. Yeah. Where are we? Oh my gosh. Okay, we're in. I am trying to get a special guest here for you who's like my number one cookie fan. Buttercum! There you go. There She's you very go. hilarious and finicky. Okay, here we go. Butter! Butter! <laughs> Maybe not. She uh, is like my number one sous chef in the kitchen at home. I but see her my... all the time on your videos. I see her there and you talk to her. So it's great to have like a sidekick. I need, it I, is. my dog went to spend the night last night with my daughter. So I have nobody here to talk to today. <laughs> Isn't it funny that a dog can do that for you? Wow, you know, so many people I know who are home alone who have dogs feel like they're not home alone, right? They have so somebody to care for, they have a companion. And so obviously dogs, animals bring us so much joy, but I love watching you talk to your dog in the middle of your <laughs> yeah. So tell us about, this is one thing I actually can make, Christine. I'm excited okay. because I'm a huge cookie fan. I, I'm not supposed to eat cookies, but I eat them all the time. So I love that you're making them. This is easy, right? It's so simple. So this is the recipe that I, that was my first recipe when I started Bake Club almost 60 days ago. It's one of my favorite recipes. It's a family recipe. So I call it a hand-me-down. It's oh, a I recipe that my grandma used to make and she handed, handed it down to me. You know, like hand-me-downs get a bad rap for clothes when you're a kid. <laughs> but it's like, it is the recipe that fuels me anytime. And it's perfect for novice bakers for people that are baking with little kids or with friends it kind of sort of like um inspires a party and it's really fun if you're sort of decorative or if you're not sure about things there's a lot of different places you can go they're cut out cookies right and then there's glazes that you can make with anything in your fridge um to sort of give them color and flavor and imagination so it's the kind of like arts and crafts meets baking this is it this is it and it's perfect for a sunday it's perfect to celebrate cookies with and around because every single person's cutout cookie looks different. And I love that because that's just a celebration of what we are as people. We're all different. Yes. We all have something unique and individual and quirky. And so. what, I, what I love about this, Christina, and you can start, is that you were saying at the very beginning about you were trying to figure out every day about how to say thank you. Yeah. And making cookies and dropping them at a neighbor's or making cookies and giving yeah. them somebody is such a great way of saying thank you people are so excited oh, there we are there's butter. i got her i got her butter so there this is butter she's six months old she also brings neighbors a lot of joy people on the streets she's she's having a very exciting sunday today and she does not want to spend time with me in the kitchen there right you go now. well i do i do so that's good i'm glad she does it i do but i think that's a great <laughs> way so to sweet. 
while you cook, Christina, you've also been saying, I know, thank you with a lot of your baked products to healthcare workers. Yes. Yes. That is, I mean, a, a, a friend that we have in common, Simon Sinek, was, um, we were Zoom dinnering a few weeks ago, and he was just so moved by the story that he read in, in early days uh, quarantine about healthcare workers in the UK being asked, what is it that you're craving? Yes. What is it that you need other than medical supplies and so on and so forth? And they said, cookies and cakes and pies. And that for me was just like, we are here. We're going to figure out how to show up in any capacity. And there is something about the power of a cookie. And yeah. when you're not going through COVID-19, like it sounds like this hokey over idealistic thing, but it's what my entire dream of Milk Bar in building this bakery has been about. And it's, I mean, it's been, it is, it has been the challenge of a lifetime, but also the joy of a lifetime. I love that. To, I love to that. get to show up. Yeah, I so love that, that while Christina cooks. And once again, her recipe is in the Sunday paper. She has a bake club on her Instagram all the time, uh, every day. So when she's um, cooking here, I think the idea, how simple the act of saying thank you, how powerful. I love that the challenge of a lifetime meets the joy of a lifetime. And I think that's what they don't tell you so much about life, about how these two things can be held simultaneously a yes. challenge with a joy, a heartache yes. with, the, with love, right? All of these kind of opposites, these paradoxes, we, we don't talk enough about how we hold both of those, the joy of achieving a small business and how hard it is simultaneously, right? Yes, it's so true. And it can be both things, right? Like life can be hard and yeah. it can be easy. It can be difficult and it can be rewarding yeah um it can okay be, so what are you doing now what are you doing <laughs> okay so i have uh, so the cutout cookie itself is four ingredients okay it's two okay. sticks of butter it's a half a cup of light brown sugar it is a half a teaspoon of salt and it's two and a quarter cups of flour it's four ingredients which for me is like four there's ingredients. no excuse there's <laughs> please no don't excuse freeze again oh god okay. in the kitchen Okay, with I'm with there you. I got that. I got so that. It's, so you take room temperature butter and you mix it together with light brown sugar, flour, and salt. And you bring it together just until it forms what kind of looks like a pie dough in its consistency. Because it's a cutout cookie, so it's going to mimic that sort of buttery, almost short bready type mixture. Uh -huh. And once it, once it meets this stage... Okay. You give it a moment and you let it rest um, before you start to roll it out. You turn your oven on to 350 degrees Fahrenheit and you pull out your favorite cookie cutters. And by the way, I am not in a place where I, I don't know where my cookie cutters are. So using, I'm with you. Like I do this for a living and I'm like, I don't know where my cookie cutters are. I'm not thinking about cookie cutters. I'm trying to like keep my drawers open and show up at 2 p.m. at Bay Club for others and for myself and so you don't have to everything you don't have to worry about it we have the recipe in the sunday cool. paper cool. it's there four ingredients you get it to that consistency you put it in the oven you cut it out you decorate That's right. it however and it's delicious that's all we need to know right that's it and this is what i mean depending on who's decorating them oh this wow. is what they look like Oh my God, that's so great. I actually know where my cookie cutters are, but I don't know how to make the cookies. Now I know <laughs> how to make the cookies and I have the cookie cutters and I'm gonna make some and give them to our mutual friend, Simon, who's also in the Sunday paper today. I love that. I was looking at his, what, what he wants to be. And I just, that, that rings so true with me. Well, thank you, Christina. I really appreciate you joining us on the Sunday Paper Live. Thank you for sharing your recipe. Thank you for showing up the way you do all the time with the joy and enthusiasm. Thank you for wearing both hats as a small business <laughs> owner and a person who's trying to keep it all together. And thank you for showing the gratitude and being with us today on World Baking Day. Thank you. And thank you so much for the support. It means the world. And I share all those thank yous with all of the other small business owners, restaurateurs, bakers, and so on. 
we need the thanks uh and i and i share it with them because it means a lot thank you well thank you christina and my my christina is your number one fan so i love oh, i love thanks. it give her my bye, 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 bye maria bye, bye, bye everyone happy baking <laughs> Woo, that's so great well, the, the recipe for her sugar cookie, her cutout sugar cookies is in today's Sunday paper. The Sunday paper is a free digital newsletter you get by just subscribing. You can go to mariashriver.com and get it. There's also a Sunday paper Instagram. Uh, we will put up that recipe. Not today, because today we put up the paper, but um, I'd actually, it's all in there together. And now I'm going to try to figure out how to, bring in Marlo and Phil. So bear with me here a second as I request them, since we're all being kind of technically challenged today. So now I request them, Lord have mercy. I don't know how to do this. So um, I saw them earlier. So I find a little smiley face here. It says smiley face. And where are they? Marlo and Phil. Okay. Holy moly. This is, um, I'm lucky I got up early and I'm lucky I've had a lot of coffee because otherwise, oh, there she is. So now I add her, I think. I think it works like that. Hope to God it works like that. Yeah, we need Patrick here. Ah! Hi. 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 There we are, Marlo and Phil. <laughs> From How our kitchen to your kitchen. I love it. I love it. Happy Sunday to you. Thank and thank you, you so thank much. You. Oh. Well, I'm we so thrilled. And congratulations on this great book and your piece today. We excerpted it in the Sunday paper today, What Makes a Marriage Last. And you thank put it you. out in the quarantine. How's the book tour going, first of all? Well, the book is going great. We've been, it's been interesting not having to travel anywhere. We uh -huh. don't have a bookstore. We just stay at home in our kitchen and talk to the world. That's been fun. And my husband can tell you how we're doing. Actually, we're a bestseller. <laughs> no, I meant, I meant how we're doing. Well, how I would, I would, doing. yes, I, you're a bestseller as a couple. You're bestsellers individually. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I think what you're doing is also selling really great advice. I love, Marla, you said uh, there's not one thing that makes a marriage last. There's a million different things. And this yeah. is not a how-to book. It's a what book. What does that mean exactly? Well, because if it was a how-to book, it could be a pamphlet, right? How to be nice to each other, make his favorite eggs, you know, that kind of stuff. But this is really like, what? What did you all do when this happened? You know, uh, Kira Sedgwick said something really concise, which I love. She said, you have to go into marriage with no plan B. That's it. Yeah. Don't look at the escape route. No matter what happens, you know, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis talked about her drug addiction. And David Berker talked about his alcoholism. Uh, and there's everything you can imagine. There's the illness of Michael J. Fox, which is a lifelong uh, event. There's infidelity. There's a kid who's very sick his whole life, like Al Hunt and, and uh, Judy Woodruff. E uh, uh, Kira and Kevin lost all their money, 30 years of savings to Bernie Madoff. So these things happen in people's lives, and some people run for the exit. And um, I think if you're looking for something easy, you, you won't find it in marriage. It's just not going to be there. And I love Peter Herman, who's Mariska Hargitay's husband. He's a very bright guy, very thoughtful guy. And he said, people get married to have the other person make you happy. He said, and that isn't going to work. He said, happiness is going to come from what you build together. If you're looking for someone to make you happy, they won't. And in a couple of years, you'll think, well, they don't make me happy. I'll go find somebody else. Or well, maybe they'll make me happy until this goes on and on and on. And you'll never find that person to make you happy because it's what you build together. And it's a lot, it's a lot more complicated to bust a marriage than it is to save it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, uh, I know. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm just, I think you, you said also in the book that you guys had a, a, a kind of ironclad rule that you would never work together. You wouldn't work together on a project and you broke it for this. Why? <laughs> well, first of all, 
we didn't want to do it. it, it you talk, sweetheart. I, I, I'm always intimidated. He's a great interviewer, but he doesn't like to be interviewed, right? Yeah, well, he is a great interviewer. I can attend. We could have that. you on our Instagram. <laughs> He'd have a good time. But I'm going to make you answer this one. Why okay, did we Phil, speak? Well, we're both A personalities. That's one thing. And uh, we're both very accustomed to running our own show. Marlo wrote the checks for people who worked for her on that girl. And uh, I didn't write the checks, but I... But you ran everything else. I, I, I certainly did. I was spoiled and had a lot of very talented people supporting me, so... But we were afraid we'd butt heads, you know? And what it, but because it was our 40th anniversary, we wanted to do something special. And for all the time we've been married, people have been asking us, how has how your marriage lasted? What have you done? What's the secret? Yeah. And we've always said, we don't know. We're not experts. We're not psychologists. We're lucky. We don't know why it's working. But then when we were celebrating our 39th, we thought it would be fun to go out and talk to a lot of people who've been married a while and find out what is it? What, what is the glue that makes people stay together? And one of the things I think it is that Judy Viorst, you know, the wonderful children's writer, mm -hmm. she said, no matter how hard you try, he's never going to be you, and you're never going to be him. So let's start with that. And then start, start accommodating what he's different about, you know, and we are so different, as you can see, <laughs> you know. Uh, but what is the, you said that people always ask you, what is the secret? And I know you're actually celebrating your 40th anniversary right. this coming week. Um, what is, do you think, um, the thing that has held you together for 40 years? I think, I think a trust that is not just about will we or not uh, betray each other. It's will we have each other's best interest at heart. Back. Yeah, will you have my back when I really need it, even if it inconveniences you? And that was something that in 1991, shortly after my father had died, I was offered the national tour of Six Degrees of Separation, which is a perfect part for me. And it was being uh, done by Lincoln Center and Jerry Sachs, the original director, was going to be directing it. And But it was an eight-month tour, which would be very trying on our marriage. So as much as I wanted to do it, I was a little afraid of what it would do to us. So I went to Phil and I said, tell me the truth. Do you think we'll make this with you working all week and me working, us getting back and forth to each other? And he said to me, if I needed this as much as you do, I'd do it. Now that, that was going to inconvenience him. He was going to have to travel a lot. He was going to have to be alone a lot. And when he said that, I thought, I can trust this man with my head. Trusting him with my head is almost more important than anything I can think of. Because well, any you trusted him also with your heart. Uh, Phil, I think it's also interesting. So many people, you came into this marriage with children, right? And yes. I think there's so many people who've had a divorce or have separated, who have hopes that they'll find their 40 year on their second time or go around. And they struggle with the idea of a blended family. They struggle with should I try again? How do I give my heart over a second time? What's your advice on that? Well, uh, first of all, I think uh, the first thing is to respect the other person's children. Uh, and that's not easy because they're not your children. Right. But you have taken sort of, you've taken them under your wing. Right. And in our case, you know, four boys living in Winnetka, uh, they liked it when Marlo came. Uh, he, he, one of, who was it, Kevin? Michael. Michael said, well, we like it when you're here, Marlo. Dad doesn't have as many spazzes. <laughs> but so, but uh, Phil also made it very clear from the beginning, as I did, I'm not your mom. You have a mom who's alive. I'm not your parent. I'm here to be a cheerleader. But we will be a decision-making entity. We will make decisions together as to what's good for all of us as a family. Wow. So I like this bystander person who was like a housekeeper or a, what do you call it, a poiree? What do you call those women who take care of children? Um, uh, that's called you know, a... Uh, 
Well, uh -huh. you're, what you were saying, I like what you said there. You said that we'll be a decision-making entity. Right. So you, you set the stage for like, okay, we're here and we're in this together. And right. I think that that brings a lot of hope to people who have, you know, who are on their second marriages, that right. their second marriage can be really hopeful. And that, you know, there are lessons from these 40 couples. You spoke to 40 different couples who all have very different marriages, all right. have very different experiences. Is there one thing you think all of you share? Uh, you want to take that? Well, I think uh, you, we could almost tell why, why they stayed together. Why? Well, both... Uh, both of them wanted to keep yeah, it. Yeah, they, they really they, wanted the marriage. They went through everything to make it work. They went to marriage counseling. They, they did everything they could when they hit the rough spot. When, when, when there's a moment when you say to yourself, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to go. There's a better place for me. I don't need this aggravation. Yeah. Um, they didn't take the escape route. I think of many of them, you said, almost all of them, I guess it was Phil or Ma, I don't know which one of you said, it, uh, go to therapy. And I yeah. think that's something that's much more acceptable or much more spoken about today than... Right. It's, and it's an act of love, too. That is, that is just as powerful a statement of love as there is. I mean, to actually voluntarily... Turn yourself over. Yeah, yeah. bring yourself to. Uh... I, I like what Brian Cranston said. He's married to Robin Dearden. They're a wonderful couple. And he said, if you get a warning sign in your car, you don't pull over and take up the hood and try to fix it. You take it to an expert. If you get a warning sign in your marriage, take it to an expert. He said, and you're not looking for a referee. You're, you're looking for an interpreter. Somebody that says, no, 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 that's not what she meant. Oh, no, no, this is what he's trying to say. We have not been in couples therapy. We did it kind of the hard way. We really fought our way through the first 10 years because we had a very difficult first 10 years. We had a commuter marriage. I was living in LA producing television films. He was in Chicago doing a daily show and raising four sons on his own. So the traveling, we broke up once for a couple of months because we both said we can't do this. And then we decided wow. to get moved to New York. We, we missed each other. I went back to an old boyfriend, which is what you always do when you break up. He started dating other women. We missed each other. And after three months, we, he called me in the middle of the night and said, okay, I, I give up. Let's, do, let's figure a way to get this done. So he moved his show to New York, and I moved to New York, and we made a life. So made he, a he made a big concession. Phil, was that, that was a huge decision to move. You had this incredibly successful, legendary show, for those of you who don't know. And you picked it up and said, I'm moving for this woman. Yes, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is true. I, and uh, she, she appreciated it. Now, I was lucky in that the company was all for me moving to New York. Um, you know, we started in Dayton, Ohio. You know, there's not a, not the crossroads of the world. And I also left my family and my home. I sold my home. I grew up in L.A., went all through school at Marymount, went to USC, did my That Girl show. I mean, my whole life was there. We came to New York. I had a couple of friends here, but we made a life. We didn't have a life here. So it was kind of scary for both of us. But I don't think he moved for me so much. I know this sounds... He cool. said he moved for you, Marlo. Just no, but I think, he, I think he moved for us. We okay. couldn't have a life any other way. You know, I mean, that, okay. that's really the truth of it. I made him happy. He made me happy. The only way we could put it together was to live in the same city. And, and uh, Well, we're very lucky to have even had the option. Right, exactly. I yeah. mean, most people don't. Right. And, and he brought <clears throat> his producers with him. The, the, the uh, company, Multimedia, moved everybody that wanted to come to New wow. York. So they were thrilled. They thought, you know, I was like the fairy godmother. I brought everybody together. So listen, you guys have been married 40 years. You go around, you spend the year talking to all these couples. This book comes down while you're in quarantine. Have <laughs> you learned anything new about each other by being in quarantine together that you wish you'd put in the book? <laughs> well, I have to drag him from the news. I have to do the dance of the seven veils to get him not to watch the news all day long. Uh, that's for sure. I lure him with 
smells of popcorn so we can watch a movie on television. He's into movies. Uh, he's into I'm news. watching cable news. I can watch the news for an hour. And again, you know it's going to be the same news every hour. Yeah, that's so, true. What have you learned about me? Well, I've learned that um, I'm married to a water bug. <laughs> a I mean, water bug? A water bug, yeah. She what? can. Well, <laughs> did you ever watch a water bug? <laughs> I'm they not make sure. a I'm help me here. They make a right turn and a left turn. I mean, it's fabulous. I mean, we should all have this ability. They're just fab. They can do nine things at once, and that's pretty much Marlo. I mean, she can too. She's on the phone. She's got something going on the stove, and then the the other phone rings, and I'm I'm watching this. But you know what's funny? But I love that. I love that because I think I, I haven't heard a water bug, but I'm like that. I'm, my brother's always said, you're a monkey brain, but you, <laughs> you celebrate who she is. You celebrate something that I might think, otherwise be right. kind of like yeah. crazy I'm, making. I'm impressed by it very much. But you said the other day, I'm just glad I'm one of the things you're juggling. That's what he said to yeah. me. So yeah. I'm glad I'm one of the things you're juggling. But the funny thing about being in quarantine is, we have this housekeeper for 30 years that we love and who takes care of us like a mama. She's not here and we're cooking ourselves. And we've really never done that before, you know? And we've never eaten three meals a day together except if we're on vacation. And I've never done the laundry. And he's before. done the laundry, which he's never done. Tell them what you, tell Maria, I want her to know what you did. I with. did not know <laughs> which, which uh, appliance <laughs> was the dryer and which was the washer. Now that's... I well, mean, they both have the same round window. Yeah, so but don't can't... tell anybody else that. Just tell it to me <laughs> and I won't tell anybody that. But I feel you. I feel you. And I still haven't figured out colors. No. You know, I have... I'm wearing pink um underwear now. <laughs> but I'll so tell you, it's... what I think is good, and, that, and you asked a good question, and I hope we answered it, is that... There really are 40 different secrets because every single couple had to get over the hump of, of their own challenge and sometimes more than one, two, three, four challenges. And, and each way that they did it by, by bonding together, by giving away certain things that they really didn't need, that they were hanging on to, that we had that kind of power struggle. When we got married, I was very independent. I never wanted to be married. And I was very concerned about being dominated because my father and all of his brothers were these Lebanese. My father was one of nine Lebanese boys. And I saw all these marriages where the men ran the show and I thought, I can't do that. So I was always looking for where he was trying to dominate me. He had a very bossy mother. So he was always looking for where I was trying to boss him. So we had you know, a power struggle yeah. going, I would say for 10 years, you know, until we kindly, kind, kindly and finally looked at each other and said, what's this about? And we, and we don't have wars anymore. Tell we'll, them what James Carville said. That, that's a great piece of it. Carville said, when you find yourself going around and around and around on an issue that's you know, tomorrow you're going to realize is not important. When you find yourself doing that, kick that can down the road. I and, like that. Yeah, yeah, we did too. We've um, been using it. Every now and then we'll be getting into one of those stupid fights where you didn't know, you said you would, but you didn't, but you couldn't, but all that. And at one point he said to me just a couple of weeks ago, let's just kick this can down the road. And it was so liberating. It really was. And Carville said, behind every marriage, there's this long line of cans that have been kicked. And if you can't do that, if you can't step around it, and step over it and say, oh, the hell with it. It's not that important. If you can't do that, then you're going to be left in this, this struggle forever, which we were for many, many years. I love that. I, I think, you know, there's both of you have done so much independently. Uh, Mar Marla, several people on here, thank you so much for your work with St. Jude's. You wrote <laughs> books before you met Phil. Phil had the number one talk show in the nation. Both of you kind of independent entities that came together and have created this us. Do you think your us will be your legacy or is your legacy? Oh, Maria, I don't know. I mean, 
you with all the great legacies in your life. How do we know anything? Yeah. The fact, if we can just live well, you know, not get sick, be able to live a nice, pleasant life in the home that we love and take care of each other and the kids, that's, that's now. I mean, I think we live in the now. You know, what happens after we're gone, everybody else will decide. If they bother to remember, you know? Yeah, but you wanted, obviously, to put something out into the world about the power of us, about the power of being yeah. a marriage, about that it's okay for two independent, strong-willed people to come together uh, and, and make that a priority. So there must have been something you wanted the world to know about the value of marriage in this time, where a lot of young people think, like, what's the point? Or a lot of people who have gotten divorced think, I can't do it again. So there must have been this kind of like hope or wish uh, that you had well, you're, uh, for all of us. You're right. You're a wise woman. We, we, well, no, really. We, we were talking about 30, in our 39th anniversary before we started this. We were talking about how much men and women had seemed to deteriorate. There was all this suspicion and contempt between men and women. Yeah. He said that and she said that and he did that and you did that. And and much of it was well founded and but it was causing such disruption and we were sort of losing the idea of love and trust and half of us got divorced. Imagine. So, right. Half so, of us. So right. we so we started saying, what should we do for our fortieth? Should we take a trip? Should we give a big party? You know, what should we do? And then we started saying Maybe we should do that thing that everybody's always asked us to do, is investigate what made our marriage work and what made other marriages work. And he said, in his usual way, I'm not talking about our marriage. So I said, OK, which is what I always say when he says he doesn't want to do something. I've learned that. I said, OK, honey, you don't have to. But once we started, it was like a double date. You know, a husband and wife sitting down with another husband and wife. Yeah. People, people, we went to everybody's home. Everything was face to face, no phone calls. Uh, they put out a bottle of wine and some cheese and crackers and hummus and stuff, and we'd start talking. And well, once we mentioned our marriage, I mean, we thought we we thought maybe we'd have twenty minutes. A half hour, we thought maybe. Half hour. Everything was most. three hours. Oh, three two hours. And a half, three hours. I mean, and they were great conversations, and we've become friends with many of these couples that we didn't know before. I so, find that people yeah. really always want to talk about the things you never think they want to talk about. Right. And, when, and you know this, Phil, better than anybody, right? Once you ask whatever the right question is and you have the ability to listen, the floodgates open. And I think that that's, people really want to have meaningful conversations. They want to ask somebody like you. Obviously. Give, yeah. Right? And, and, you, was, and you, well, go ahead, sweetie. Well, no, that was apparent to us immediately. Yeah. And, uh, uh, really, I... I did not expect this kind of, I mean, honesty. Two, honesty. two and a half hours. Uh, you know, and finally I would say, you know, I'm really sorry, but we have to go. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, a lot of people have asked us, well, did you see any difference between uh, black, white, and brown marriages, or same sex or opposite sex marriages, or different faith? You know, we have Christians yeah. and Jews and Baptists and Muslim and everybody. And there is no difference. Everybody wants the same thing. They want somebody they can count on. They want somebody that's got their back. They want unconditional love. They, they, they want somebody who's not going to judge them, but is going to assist them, you know, be kind and loving, you know, it's who will snuggle, you know, yeah. it's the same thing. We just, we just want a safe place, a place where you're safe and you can say, this is it. Okay. We're here. And, you're not going to kill me. I'm not going to kill you. If we could just make that agreement. A safe place. Well, thank you, Marlo and Phil. I want to thank you so much. Congratulations on this book. Thank you for doing the work of going around to sit down and talk with people and then putting it out there. Uh, and it really, I think it's so hopeful, right? Whether you're in the first, your first marriage, whether you're in a second marriage, whether you're of different faiths, different genders, all of that, I think you're absolutely right. We all want somebody that sees us, that we can trust, and that has our back. And I think people are learning that right now more than ever. Bye. Thank well, you. Thank you. Congratulations on the book. You. Thank great, you. And all your great work. Thank you for coming on. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.
Now how do we get up? Well, now you just, I remove you and I turn this thing around because I just did it backwards. Whoa. Okay. What a day. Anyway, um, they are so inspiring. Uh, I love that. I love uh, that he tried again. He left his heart open and they got a 40-year marriage on the second time. So for those of you out there who uh, are starting again, or who want to start again, there's hope in this book. Um, for those of you who might be in a valley in your relationship, there's advice in this book. And those of you uh, who are cruising along or wondering about therapy, I think that's really great that they mentioned that, how important that is uh, in a relationship. I think they're inspiring. Her work on St. Jude's with St. Jude's, always inspiring. And I think this book uh, will also inspire us. I, I want to leave you with one of the reflections every uh, week in the Sunday paper. We put a reflection in, and today's is from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And it says, the most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found their way out of the depths. These persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity, and an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness, and a deep loving concern. So if you're struggling, know that you're that person and know that that will make you better. If you've lost your job during this time, if you've lost hope, if you're scared or anxious, um, try to think about that quote and know that whatever is happening now will make you a person who understands struggle perhaps in a new way. It might make you a different kind of a person, but no doubt it will make you a more empathetic, loving, compassionate person. So I wish for all of you a beautiful Sunday a beautiful baking day. I wish uh, all of you who want it that you have a person uh, next to you that you can put your hand on like that, that's got your back. If uh, you want that, make a wish for it. Um, it's possible. And also every Sunday, I always end my, I've been thinking, I always end it with a prayer. And today's prayer is, Dear God, May I view our world as one filled with possibility instead of despair. May I see the good around me instead of wishing that things would change. Empower me to do what I can to make them better. May I move humanity forward in my own way, one person at a time. Amen. Have a beautiful Sunday. And thanks so much for joining Sunday Paper Live.